So welcome everyone. Uh, we are happy to have Tyler Edison, who will be telling us about Floquet codes with a twist. For you. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Sorry for the slow start. And also thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to share what we've been up to. I'll talk about work that was done in collaboration with Joe Sullivan, Arpit Dua, and Nat Tantivastakar. Maybe just because of the, the slow start, I'll, I'll start the talk with the conclusion. Okay. Here's the main takeaway. I'm gonna tell you about a scheme for storing and protecting quantum information in a dynamical quantum error correcting code called a Floquet code by introducing irregularities into the code called twist effects. These twist effects are constructed by condensing fermions along lines. I put this in a black box that might not make sense at this point. Hopefully by the end of the talk, those words will make more sense when you play this talk back in reverse, then everything will be clear. Let's start with some motivation. Um, maybe I can give some motivation to you all to ask questions throughout my talk. Please don't hesitate to interrupt me if something's unclear. Uh, naive questions are especially welcome. If it is unclear, it, assume it's my fault, not yours. So please do ask questions. The motivation comes from quantum computing. If we want to build a quantum computer, we need to ensure that that information that's being processed in the quantum computer is safe from noise from the environment. <clears throat> quantum computers are inherently susceptible to noise. There are predominantly two reasons for this. First of all, the components of a quantum computer are small, sometimes atomically small, and that makes them error prone. Uh, if there are small fluctuations in the environment or a cosmic ray particle whizzing by that can corrupt information and destroy information. The second factor going into this story is that classical error correction won't work. We have to deal with quantum errors. There are bit flips that can flip your state from zero to one or one to zero. There are also more potent errors, phase flips, which can change the relative phase between the zero and one state for example. So what do we do? Classical error correction won't work. So we just toss quantum in front of this and we use quantum error correction. The idea behind quantum error correction is that we store the quantum information redundantly using a larger Hilbert space, possibly many qubits. And using this redundancy, we hope to be able to detect errors before they corrupt our information and correct them. There are many quantum error correcting codes on the market. There are stabilizer codes, topological quantum error correcting codes, bosonic codes, which encode the quantum information in uh, the space of a harmonic oscillator. One especially promising and relevant quantum error correcting for code for this talk is the toric code. Now the toric code has seen um, pretty substantial progress in just the last few years, what I have shown here are two experimental realizations of the entangled state of the Toric code that's needed to store quantum information. Now, even though the Toric code is promising, it's still important to explore the space of, yeah. Are these experimental ones all sort of <clears throat> like sycamore type qubits or other different types? This, this one is on superconducting qubits. That's that's from Google's work. Mm -hmm. This one is in a Rydberg array. Oh. <clears throat> but since then, people have also used trapped ions and other platforms. Yeah, thanks for the question. What I'm saying is that it's important to explore the space of quantum error correcting codes just to help find codes that might make the information more robust to errors, reduce computational overheads in both space and time, and in general, find codes that are better suited to our current hardware. One new kid on the block are the Floquet codes. 
flow pay codes are different from the quantum error correcting codes that I showed on the previous slide, and that the encoding of the quantum information changes in time according to a periodic schedule. In this work, I'll describe a way to encode quantum information in a flow K code by introducing irregularities called twist defects. These have certain advantages over the original construction of the Z2 flow K code, which I'll describe momentarily. What's the advantage of having the encoding change in time? Yeah, one advantage is that it can simplify the measurements that are needed. So in the Torah code, you end up having to make four body measurements that requires entangling four qubits to an ancillary qubit then measuring that ancillary qubit that takes time and for some platforms that kind of entangling is difficult to do relative to the flow k code that i'll show you where all you need are two body measurements some platforms two body measurements are native and so it actually makes the flow k codes a competitive alternative to the toric code and it's not possible to extract the information with two body measurements in a time independent code. You can, you can do this, but um, the protocols for doing this, you can compile these measurements with just two body measurements, but those protocols take a long time relative to what I'll show you with the flow K code. It's all about trade offs here, and here you gain some advantage and you can do things quickly with two body measurements. Here's some spoilers for the next. I have 40 minutes. The next 40 minutes. So I'd like to discuss twist okay. effects. Don't worry about the slow start. Just start. <laughs> just keep Finish one after <laughs> okay. one hour after you start. Okay, okay, okay. Or until people get bored. So ultimately, I'd like to discuss twist effects in the Z2 flow K code. This is a particular example of a flow K code. Twist effects first have shown up in the context of the Toric code. So I'll start by introducing twist effects in the Toric code that will entail reviewing some of the basics of the Toric code and describing how to actually construct twist effects in those codes. Then I'll move on to the Z2 flow K code and our construction of twist effects. I'll conclude by going over some work in progress and future directions. So as promised, a review of the Toric code. The Toric code is a quantum error correcting code defined on a square lattice with a qubit at each edge. The operator algebra of the qubit is generated by poly X and poly Z operators. I'll represent these with a capital X and a capital Z using quantum information notation. The Toric code is then defined by specifying a group of mutually commuting products of poly operators called the stabilizer group. The stabilizer group for the Torah code is generated by two types of stabilizers. There's a vertex stabilizer, which is a product of poly X operators around a vertex. There's one of these generators for each vertex. There's also a plaquette stabilizer, which is a product of poly Z operators around a plaquette. And there's a stabilizer, plaquette stabilizer for each plaquette. You can check using the commutation relations that these are mutually commuting poly operators. That means that they can be simultaneously diagonalized and we store quantum information in the mutual plus one eigenspace of these stabilizers. That space is referred to as the code space. The code space for the Toric code is four dimensional, meaning that we can encode or store the information of two qubits. These qubits are referred to as the logical qubits. One benefit of the Toric code is that the code states are locally indistinguishable, meaning that if there's local noise from the environment, we can always detect it and correct it without our information being corrupted. So just to save myself time, with no benefit to you all, I'm gonna change the notation slightly and replace X's and Z's with colored lines. So I'll represent the X operators by a red line and the Z operators by a blue line. Now, beyond being a stabilizer code defined in terms of a stabilizer group, the Toric code is also an example of a topological quantum error correcting code. This means that its properties are characterized by the same data that characterizes a topological order. In particular, the Toric code is characterized by a set of anions. 
In this context, anions are violations of stabilizers that can't be created or destroyed by local operators. There are three non-trivial types of anions in the Torah code. The first corresponds to a violation of a vertex stabilizer. These are created by a string of poly Z operators, a product of poly Z operators along a string. This string operator commutes with all the stabilizer generators along its length and only fails to commute with the vertex stabilizers at the endpoints. We refer to these anions as the E anions. This is a reference to the fact that the underlying topological order is that of a deconfined Z2 gauge theory, and these are like the electric charges. The other type of anion that I'd like to point out is the M anion. This corresponds to a violation of the plaquette stabilizers, and it's created by a product of poly X operators along a path in the dual lattice. And finally, we can take a composite of an E and M. This is an EM anion. There should be an E here because there's both E and M. That's a typo. An EM, most interestingly and relevant for this talk, is an emergent fermion. If we take two EM anions, exchange their positions, the wave function is anti-symmetric, and we incur a factor of minus one. So many of the properties of the torque code can be understood entirely in terms of the anions. One thing to notice is that the vertex stabilizer itself can be interpreted as a small loop of M string operator. And the plaquette stabilizer can be interpreted as a small loop of E string operator. Now, if we put our system on a torus, you might ask what happens to the, the loops around non, along non-trivial cycles. Those commute with all the stabilizers, but are not themselves generated by the stabilizer group. That means that they act within this code space. They act non-trivially within this code space. They represent our logical operators. Again, the code space of the Torah code is four-dimensional. There are two logical qubits. And here's a way of representing the logical operators on those qubits. So for this first logical qubit, there's this a loop, non-contractable loop of M string. That represents the poly X operator in the logical subspace in the code subspace. There's a non-contractable loop of E string that represents the poly Z. This is great, we can store information now. It's well protected from local errors, but there are some issues, some practical issues. One issue is that this is a non-planar geometry. That uh, is a challenge for certain platforms, especially if we want to preserve locality. Now, some platforms can realize these non-planar geometries and have, but if we want to be able to put this code on, 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 on a wide array of platforms, then it's ideal to have a planar geometry and store quantum information in plane. Yeah. This is a dumb question that you said at the beginning that was, that was good. Um, when you say the code stores four qubits, yeah. do you mean four total or four per site? It's still, it, it, it stores two qubits. Excuse me, two qubits. Yeah, there are two logical qubits right. and they're spread out. And they're total. Two total on a torus. Yeah, and they're spread out, they're, they're non-local. I'm showing you that here are the X and Z operators for those spread out qubits. Uh, so what, what's, um, what's the good thing that gets bigger as you make the lattice bigger? Like how much error correction, extra error correction do you get per site? How, how does that scale with size? Um, yeah, so the co one measure of the protection of the code is the code distance. That's the minimum number of poly operators that you need to create one of these logical operators. And that code distance grows linearly with the linear size of this torus. So it grows like the square root of the number of total number of qubits. Yeah, good questions. So, yeah. So the, I guess like the minimum number of physical qubits you need so four around this way and four around that way. Is that what you want The minimum, you want a minimal torus. I just mean like you make your smallest torus possible. I think if this. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> yeah, something like that. I mean, you, you, can, you can make this pretty pathological and do it with like four qubits if you really want. But I think it's just one qubit on the torus. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so in order to, oh, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that logical gates are challenging. The information is stored non-locally on this torus. In order to do logical gates, one way to you know, operate on the quantum information in the code space is to do a, a rather complicated process of splitting open the torus, rotating it by 300 degrees and gluing it back together. This is impractical and slow. So our resolution will be to create twist defects. These are irregularities in the code that allows for a planar geometry and it gives a means of doing logical operations. Before I move on, are there any lingering questions just about the Torah code? Okay. The standard approach in the quantum information community to constructing twist defects goes as follows. First, you identify zero form symmetries of the Torah code stabilizer group. These are symmetries over all of space. Then you create a branch cut or a symmetry defect. I'll refer to it as a defect line on a path with endpoints. The endpoints of that defect line are precisely the twist defects. Let's see this in action. Here is the zero form symmetry of the Torah code. It's composed of two operations, a translation and a Hadamard, where Hadamard maps X to Z and Z to X. So to see that it's invariant under the symmetry, let's go step by step. So first, there's a translation by this a vector at a 45 degree angle. It maps vertices to plaquettes and plaquettes to vertices. So here's what that looks like. I'm just gonna shift these operators. The vertex term was a product of poly X's around a vertex. Now it's a product of X's around a plaquette. I can go back again. These guys are just shifted. The next step is to apply how to mark it. That switches the colors from red to blue and blue to red. So there's the application of the Hadamard market. You see that we're mapped back to the same generators of the stabilizer group. So this is a symmetry of the stabilizer group. The symmetry is non-trivial in the sense that it acts non-trivially on the anions. To see this, you can already see this from the, from the demonstration that I just gave because that vertex term is mapped to a plaquette term. The plaquette term, which is like a loop of E string, is mapped to a loop of M string. More explicitly, we can consider a state with a pair of E excitations and a pair of M excitations, and then apply these same operations. And we'll see what happens. We'll translate, here I've translated these string operators. Then we apply a Hadamard gate. It turns the E anions into M anions, the M anions, into E anions. So this zero form symmetry swaps E and M anions. To create twist defects, we create a branch cut of this symmetry. How do we create a branch cut? Well, we need to modify the stabilizers. And in effect, what we do is we act with the symmetry on all any of the stabilizers crossing this defect line. You can see here that I've taken a vertex term the product of X around a vertex. I've applied the symmetry to half of this stabilizer. So this X is translated and then turned into a Z. This has the effect that now we can create a pair of E anions, move one across this defect line. The symmetry acts on that anion and it becomes an M anion. In practice, that means that there's a string operator here that creates an E on the left, an M on the right, and commutes with all the new stabilizers along the length of the string. And now we have an object that swaps E and M. Yeah. So, so this, this operation of moving like 45 degrees, is there some operator that implements that? Uh, just some translation operator. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I also have a question. Is that a question? Sorry, I don't know if we. Oh, talk sorry, about sorry. That. Yeah, I have a question. Um, does it? Can I ask? Uh, does, does it matter that the lattice is uh, square for the symmetry? Um, 
I, there are ways. Um, let's see. I don't think that's essential. It's certainly nice for this particular representation of the symmetry. Mm -hmm. So you could define translation in on just a different lattice that's not even regular, just anything. Um, well, the representation of the zero form symmetry might look different on a different lattice. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So one property, one property is that we swap E and M across the defect line. Another property is seen by moving the E and M next to one another. We see that we can terminate a fermion string operator at the twist defect. Here's the twist defect at the endpoint. In other words, this string operator violates stabilizers at one endpoint and it commutes with all the stabilizers along its length and at its other endpoint. So here we now have two properties of twist defects and defect lines. The first is that E is turned into an M when it's moved across the defect line. The second is that we can condense or terminate a fermion string operator on the twist defect. These properties are enough for us to encode quantum information with a set of twist effects. So here's how that might look. What I have drawn on the left here are four twist defects and a set of two operators. These operators commute with all the stabilizers. This is a, a large loop of E string operator, for example. These commute with all the stabilizers, but they are not themselves products of stabilizers. So these act within a logical subspace. These I can define as the logical Z and a logical X. A pair of four, a set of four twist defects encodes a single logical qubit. The advantage here is we didn't need the overall topology of the system. We can insert twist defects in a planar geometry. And we can furthermore do a certain subset of operations on our logical qubit just by braiding these twist defects. This, for example, does a Hadamard at the level of the logical qubit. Now, let me just flash a quick slide to say that these twist defects aren't a fantasy. Here are three experimental realizations of twist defects. There are issues. We're not ready to do quantum computation with twist defects. One is that these are small system sizes. These twist defects are close together. That means we don't have much protection. The code has a small code distance. In this experiment by Continuum, for example, the twist defects correspond to these green plaquettes and they are right next to each other. And second, as I already mentioned, and uh, this is the motivation for going on to uh, Floquet codes in the next few slides, the error correction requires that we measure the stabilizers of the toric code. Those are four body operators or product of four, four more poly operators. And that takes time. And that's complicated to do on certain platforms such as Microsoft's proposed um, quantum computer built out of Majorana wires. For Majorana wires, two body measurements are native. So we might hope to find a quantum error correcting code that operates entirely off of two body measurements. And that's the case for okay codes. Yes. So, so on your previous slide, yeah. uh, you mentioned that you could do some operations on the logical qubits. Can you do all operations? So can it be like universal quantum computing in the logical yeah. subspace? Yes. Yeah. So, so the question is, what operations can you do natively here and fault tolerantly with, in a way that's robust to errors? So the most natural operations are a set of operations called Clifford operations. They're the set of operations that map Pauli operators to Pauli operators. Clifford operations aren't enough to do universal quantum computation. So you'd need additional methods, such as like magic state injection in order to do a universal gate set. Okay, before I move on to Floquet codes, are there any questions, comments, concerns, size of relief that I'm Done talking about the Toric code? Anything? Don't worry, it comes up again anyways. So. Let me start with a review of the Z2 flow K code. This is the particular flow K code that we'll be interested in. I'll start by making some 
uh, general comments about floquet codes. So the idea here is that floquet codes are a dynamical quantum error correcting code. The stabilizer group changes over time according to a periodic schedule of measurements. Each of these instantaneous stabilizer groups or ISGs defines a corresponding instantaneous code space. This is the mutual plus one eigenspace of those stabilizers. So in order for this floquet code to operate, we need to ensure that if we have information stored in one of these instantaneous code spaces, it can be transferred from one to the next. Let me just also comment that there may be a period of initialization that's necessary just to get the ball rolling. And then afterwards, this becomes periodic. So what data do I actually need to specify to define a floquet code? I need to tell you two things. The first is what gets measured. These are the checks. The second, which is unique to floquet, floquet codes is when are they measured? For the toric code, it didn't matter when I measured the vertex stabilizers, the plaquette stabilizers, because they're mutually commuting. For floquet codes, the checks are non-commuting, so the measurement schedule is all important. You need to schedule the measurements in such a way that the information can indeed be preserved. If you're careless with this, you could destroy information along the way. So this is floquet codes in abstract. Let me now describe floquet codes more concretely with an example. So this is the Z2 floquet code. The Z2 floquet code is defined on a hexagonal lattice with a qubit at each vertex. And I'll assume periodic boundary conditions. So this is on a torus. The first thing- is complained to us about being on a torus before. Yeah, so this is the, this is, yeah, good. This is my motivation now. We're on a torus. In order to put these things on planar geometry, we'll need twist defects. And that's where our work comes in. So right now, this is on a torus. This is work that's been done before by, by Hastings and Hoffman. Okay, so first thing I need to specify are the checks. In order to specify the checks, I'll label the edges of this hexagonal lattice as x, y, and z edges. x edges have positive slope, y edges have negative slope, and the z edges have zero slope. The corresponding checks are a product of two poly x operators on an x edge, Y, Y on a Y edge and Z, Z on a Z edge. The next piece of data I need to tell you is when to measure these checks. In order to do so, I'll first label the plaquettes by zero, one, and two, so that any two neighboring plaquettes are labeled by a different number. This is like a three coloring or a, like a it's a paint by number of a three coloring of your hexagonal lattice. So then define the zero checks to be the set of check operators on the zero edges, the zero edges being the edges that connect zero plaquettes. So what I've drawn here in red are the zero checks. These are, the, this one's a ZZ operator between two zero plaquettes. This one's an XX and so on. The one checks similarly, are the check operators on edges between one plaquettes, and the two checks are check operators between two plaquettes. The schedule is, is right in front of us, but I can make this explicit. There's some period of initialization. I won't go into the detail there, but I'm happy to describe that if anyone's interested. But the periodic part of the schedule goes zero checks, one checks, two checks. So I've now told you everything you need to know about the floquet code. I've told you what gets measured and when it gets measured. And in principle, my claim is that this is enough to be able to detect and correct errors. Yeah. How often you do this? Does that, what, what, what role does the sort of period play or? Yeah, so after each period, then you have enough information to detect errors. So after a full period, that's like measuring both the vertex stabilizers and the plaquette stabilizers of the toric code. What, what sets that period? What's the Hamiltonian? So 
there's no <clears throat> explicit Hamiltonian, but here's what I can give you. I can give you the instantaneous stabilizer groups. From these instantaneous stabilizer groups, if you'd like, you can define a Hamiltonian. You can define a Hamiltonian as just like, uh, you put a minus sign in front of each of these stabilizers, and then the ground state subspace of that Hamiltonian will coincide with the code space. So really you're then alternating between three different Hamiltonians. But let me try and give some intuition for these instantaneous stabilizer groups. Let's focus on the, the zero ISG. The first three generators of the zero ISG are precisely the zero checks. We've just measured the zero checks. So the system is in a definite eigenstate of the zero checks, right? plus or minus one eigenstate of those zero checks. For simplicity, let me assume that we're in the plus one eigenstate. We can keep track of the plus or minus one classically. So these definitely belong to the instantaneous stabilizer group. There are three other generators here. I'll refer to these as the plaquette stabilizers. These are products of some combination of check operators. Now, what's important to note is that we don't have to measure these plaquette stabilizers directly. The measurement outcome of these plaquette stabilizers can be inferred from the measurements of these checks given our special sequence of measurements. Explicitly, this plaquette stabilizer is a product of X, Y, and Z poly operators. This is a, indeed a product of check operators. For example, this edge is an X edge, so this should be X, X. This edge is a Z, Z edge. So X and Z combine to give us a Y in this corner. The plaquette stabilizers belong to each of the instantaneous stabilizer groups. That's because they commute with the check operators. For example, if we have a Y edge sticking off here, that's a Y, Y measurement, and that'll commute with the Y operator here, and an X, X will commute with the X operator here, and so on. Let's move from the zero ISG to the one ISG. The plaquette stabilizers remain in the instantaneous stabilizer group, but now we have the one checks in the instantaneous stabilizer group. This makes sense since we just measured the one checks. These individual generators of the zero checks are no longer in our instantaneous stabilizer group. That's because they fail to commute with the one checks. So we're no longer in a definite eigenstate of the zero checks. Okay, that was a lot of information for one slide. Are there any questions about what I just said there? Yeah. Yeah. You, you said that you can use the data of what the stabilizers are at a given time to that implicitly defines a Hamiltonian. You, you could do this. This isn't how people discuss this problem, but you could define a Hamiltonian for each of these instantaneous stabilized groups. Yeah, this one, but, I mean, you, you, you need one. Why do you say we need one? Well, to, to actually build it. Um, to build it, we don't need a Hamiltonian. You know, to build it, we might have some array of superconducting qubits, and we engineer an interaction to couple some qubits together. Then you measure, make a measurement, and that implements a measurement of one of these zero checks. Engineering the interaction is a Hamiltonian. So, that's right. That's right. But so you, you do need one. How how local is it? I mean, it's got to be local enough to actually. Well, I, I'd be careful because the Hamiltonian of the qubits is not the Hamiltonian defined by these instantaneous stabilizer groups. You're right. If you have some interaction, you, you have some engineered Hamiltonian between your qubits that implements like a, a C naught gate, some gate between your qubits that couples together, and then you make your measurements. And this is the superconducting platform Hamiltonians are local. You're just able to interact nearest neighbor qubits. But we, we don't need six body interactions or anything like this. I guess I'm a little confused. Like, uh, so everything in those boxes should, in each box should commute, right? That's right, yeah. So you argue that the ones at the top commuted with the red checks, but is it clear they also commute with the blue checks or what, what happened? It seems like you're the, sorry. There's the checks and then there's the plaquette operators. These are the checks. The and, and you said the checks, if I understood correctly, the plaquette operators commute with checks coming on the legs of the hexagon. That's right. But then uh, when you move to the next step, aren't you looking at different, you're looking at the same hexagons, but different checks. Yeah. So they're no longer coming out 
as legs or what's well, happening there? Yeah, so it, it depends on the hexagon. So here, this hexagon labeled one, sorry, this is such a small picture on this slide. This hexagon labeled one has red edges. And if I go back, you can see that there are no red edges sticking out from that hexagon. Uh -huh. So we don't have to, we don't have to worry oh, about it. Oh, I see. It just is. works because it overlaps on two sites. I see. It, sometimes they overlap on two sites and they anti commute on both. And sometimes they come. I see. So you're saying it just. That's yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, I had a particular plaquette in mind when I gave that explanation. Yeah. I see. So, so what you're saying is here, this is an X check. This is an X, X measurement. That'll commute with these plaquette stabilizers because you have an X here. So you get a minus one sign. I see. Why here? Yeah, yeah. So, so they do commute with all the check. That plaquette operators commute with all the checks. In that's correct. Okay. And that's essential to, yeah. to our, our whole argument. Okay. Let me try and make it more explicit. Sorry, one more question. Yeah, yeah. You said that you could infer the value of that from looking at the checks. So can you say again how you would get the value of the hexagon operator from the checks? Because the checks don't commute with each other, right? Yeah. So this is somewhat complicated. I'm oh, happy okay. to Maybe go. Maybe it's not worth oh, it. It's, it's not that complicated. Okay. So here, here's the idea. After we measure the, so let's say we measure these two checks. Then we start to measure the zero checks. Yeah. Now, in general, these individual two checks will fail to commute with the zero checks. Mm -hmm. But there's a special product of three two checks that'll commute with the zero checks. So in particular, on this one plaquette, this check, this check, and this check, that'll commute with all of the zero checks. I see. So not all of that information is destroyed when we I measure see. the zero checks. There's a special product of three of them that later builds up a plaquette okay. stabilizer. Okay. And that's exactly when we're able to infer the measurement outcome. Of that plaquette stabilizer. We just measure two, now we measure zero. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, so what I still haven't given much intuition for these instantaneous stabilizer groups. How are we encoding quantum information? Well, what's nice here is that each of these instantaneous stabilizer groups can be independently mapped to the stabilizer group of a toric code on a hexagonal lattice. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that there's a generalized local unitary that maps each ISG to the stabilizer group of a toric code on a hexagonal lattice. By a generalized local unitary, I mean we're allowed to add and remove ancillary qubits, and we're allowed to act with a unitary that preserves locality, maps local operators to local operators. I won't go through the details here. I'm happy to discuss it afterwards. But the point here is then we can map each of these to something that looks like a more code stabilizer group. That means that the instantaneous stabilizer groups are characterized by the same topologic order as the toric code. In other words, they have the same anions are exhibited by the instantaneous stabilizer groups. Yeah. If I can add and remove sort of trace in and out various qubits, why, why can I make that statement? Uh, I thought that's what you said was part of the generalized. Yeah, that's part of generalized here, yeah. So you can, you can add and remove ancillary qubits locally, local qubits. Now, are you asking why can I still say they're characterized by the same topological order? Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this is maybe a commentary on the classification of topological phases. It's been shown that if you have this class of generalized local unitaries, that preserves the topological order. You're only making local changes to the system. So this tells us where we're storing quantum information in the flow K code, because each at each instance of time, we have something that looks like a toric code. So again, we can interpret the logical operators as long M string operators or E string operators that wrap around non-contractible cycles. Good. So again, as Clay pointed out, this is on a torus. We don't want this on a torus. How can we put it in the planar geometry? Shortly after the original Z2 flow K code was introduced, there was a planar construction where information is stored at the boundaries. The caveat is that the period needs to be doubled. Instead of making three rounds in each period, you need to make six rounds. This slows things down. This means it takes twice as long to detect whether there are errors. 
it gives errors more time to corrupt your information. There is even an argument in this recent paper that says that if you put the flow pay code on a system with boundary like this, then this is inevitable and you need to extend the period under a technical assumption. Now the technical assumption is important if you're storing the quantum information in the boundary, but with twist defects, we can create them in the bulk and we can evade this argument. So that's what I'd like to show in the remaining time here. I don't remember how late we started. It was like 15 minutes after. <clears throat> I don't want to keep people here, but so how are we going to construct twist defects in the flow K code? The standard approach was to identify a zero form symmetry of the stabilizer group. This is complicated by the fact that we don't have a fixed stabilizer group. We can identify a zero form symmetry for each of these instantaneous stabilizer groups independently, but that zero form symmetry is represented differently at each step in time. So we might introduce a branch cut in this ISG. That won't look like a branch cut at the next ISG. We'll get some sort of mess. So we have to reintroduce a branch cut here and so on and so forth. Our solution comes from a concept introduced in the high energy community. The concept is higher gauging. So what we recognized is that the Floquet code, well, it doesn't have a zero form symmetry that's shared by the ISGs. It does have a one form symmetry that's common amongst these stabilizer groups. Here, by one form symmetry, I mean some sort of lattice notion of a one form symmetry. The operators aren't topological. Uh, they're only topological in the code space. The one form symmetry in this sense is generated precisely by these plaquette stabilizers. We know they're shared by each of the ISGs. They commute with all of the plaquette stabilizers. Intuitively, these plaquette stabilizers are tiny loops of emergent fermion string operator. So we have a one form symmetry generated by loops of emergent fermion string operator. We can construct twist defects if we have this one form symmetry. Moreover, what this one form symmetry tells us is that there's a string operator for that emergent fermion that is a, a valid string operator for each of these instantaneous stabilizer groups simultaneously. We can create fermions using the same choice of fermion string operator. Our strategy is now to condense fermions along a line. Let me describe what that means. So first I'll define Wij to be a string operator that creates emergent fermions at some site i and j. For now, we'll keep things general and discuss fermion condensation in the context of a Hamiltonian, particularly in, in, in the context of its ground state. But the fermion condensation will just give you the electromagnetic duality back again, right? So that's the point here. We could have probably done that directly with the map to the toric code in each of the that you mentioned before. Yeah, so what you're saying is we map it to the toric code yeah. and then the zero form symmetries all have the same representation. Yeah. Those unitaries are different. You're right, there, there isn't indeed a zero form symmetry for each of the ISGs, but it's a different representation and, and, and they differ by the fact that there's those unitaries that map us to the toric code or generalized unitaries are different. So that means introducing these branch cuts will look different. They'll differ by this local unitary, but. Right. So we say that fermions have been condensed along a path gamma. If there exists a set of fermion string operators, Wij, such that this expectation value goes to a constant in the limit of a large separation between I and J. Intuitively, how should you make sense of this? Well, intuitively at some fixed point, let's say we're at a fixed point and fermions have been condensed. Intuitively, I want that to mean that I can create a pair of fermions for free. What this condition is telling me that is that we can create a pair of fermions roughly for free, as long as we are at a large enough length scale. If we zoom out, this starts to behave like a fixed point again, and then I can create pairs of fermions for free. 
Now, in the context of okay codes and stabilizer codes, the statement simplifies. Here, we don't need the ground state. Our interest, our, our state of interest is the code state, as a code state. So for us, what we do to condense fermions along a line is we force those fermion string operators to be stabilizers along the line. If these string operators are stabilizers, then this expectation value by definition is one, and we've condensed fermions along the line. The code states will look like superpositions of states where you have all possible combinations of fermions along that line. So this code state that, that varies in time as well. That's the ground state of each of those one Hamiltonians. That's right. The idea here is that this string operator can be simultaneously a stabilizer in all of those ISGs. So for each of those code states, it will look like you have uh, one of these defect lines. So what's the idea here? Why does this work? Why does this give me something that looks like a defect line? There are two perspectives that I'd like to give. One I'm more comfortable with, but the other I'll make an attempt at explaining. The first is in terms of higher gauging. So it's known that in a space-time picture, you can create one of these electromagnetic uh, duality's by condensing loops of fermions along a membrane in space-time. So the picture that I'd like to articulate here is that at some instance of time, we have our instantaneous stabilizer group. This intersects that membrane, this condensation defect, if you will, along a path. This is our path gamma. Now to this plane, these look like open fermion string operators. And it looks like we've, sum, we've summed over all these loops, so it looks like the, the state has a, a sum of all possible pairs of fermions along that line. And so at least intuitively, that agrees with our definition of condensation of fermions along the line. Another question. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, could you take the code state to be like, a, like an equal superposition of the ground state of each of the three Hamiltonians? Like, well, instead of it being a ground state kind of for one of the Hamiltonians, it could be like the sum of them. And then when you uh, let the system run periodically, it somehow still has uh, an overlap of one, or is that does that not work? Um, I'm not sure what would happen. In general, if you take a superposition of all those code states, you, you get something kind of messy looking. It might not be a code state for any given instantaneous mm -hmm. stabilizer group. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Yeah, so the, the intuition that I'm more comfortable with is as follows. If you have a system of described in terms of poly operators, and you have a one-form symmetry corresponding to loops of fermion strings, then you can formally map that system of Pauli operators to a system of physical fermions described in terms of creation and annihilation operators. This is called fermionization. And what happens under this fermionization map is that this fermion string operator is mapped to some product of creation and annihilation operators that looks exactly like a string order parameter that detects whether you're in the Majorana phase. So intuitively what we're doing here by condensing emergent fermions is we're creating an emergent Majorana wire. We're creating a Majorana wire out of the emergent fermions. The Majorana zero modes at the endpoints of the Majorana wire then correspond to the twist defects. Okay, at this point, our construction, and with this background, our construction is embarrassingly simple. So I should have plenty of time to describe it in its entirety. All we need to do is ensure that there's some fermion string operators that are stabilizers of the flow K code. So this takes four steps. The first step is to define a fermion string operator along a path. You'll have to believe me that this is a fermion string operator. You can see this by taking a product of the plaquette stabilizers and truncating it. Next, we'll decompose this string operator into two body 
Pauli operators. These are like short fermion string operators. These generate all fermion string operators along that line. And we have to decompose it in such a way that each pair creates emergent fermions for all of the instantaneous stabilizer groups. The next step is to add those short string operators to the set of checks. Now we'll start measuring those short string operators. So at least at this point, at some instance of time, those will indeed be stabilizers. Right after we measure them, those will be instantaneous stabilizers. But we want them to be stabilizers in each, after each step. So what we do is we throw away some of the checks. There are some check operators that fail to commute with those short string operators, so we just don't measure those. Now by construction, these belong to the, each of the instantaneous stabilizer groups. And we've done what we've wanted, we've condensed fermions along that path. So this is our new set of checks for a Floquet code with twist defects. I need to tell you the measurement schedule. The measurement schedule is somewhat straightforward because those fermion string operators by construction commute with all the checks so we can measure them at any time. We might as well group them together with the zero checks and define this, this set of zero checks star which includes the measurement of those short string operators. So this is it, we've done it. We've constructed twist defects in a flow K code. One way to see this is to study whether it, we get a defect line in one of the ISGs. So here, for example, is the zero ISG after we've changed the set of checks and the measurement schedule. It's somewhat complicated. I don't want you to worry, worry about the details here, but do notice that this is part of the stabilizer group now. This is our short fermion string operator. So explicitly, there is some string operator now that creates an E anion to the left of the defect line and M to the right of the defect line. And this commutes with all the instantaneous stabilizers along its path. So where have we gotten? We started with the flow kick code. We've introduced twist defects. Um, so far, I've, I've kind of drawn some haze out here, but we can certainly put this on a system with a boundary. We just put the twist defects in the bulk of the system. So these twist defects can be constructed in a planar geometry. We don't have to change the connectivity of the qubits. We still maintain the fact that in order to do error correction, we only have to make two body measurements. And in contrast to other planar realizations of the flow K code, there are still only three measurement rounds per period. So that brings us full circle, probably a flow K joke there, but this is my first slide. This is the main takeaway. I've shown you how to encode quantum information in a flow K code with twist defects. We constructed those twist defects by condensing fermions along the lines. Next, I'd like to give um, just a few further comments, um, other aspects of this work that I didn't have time to describe and go over some future directions. I can make that quick, but are there any questions at this point before I move on? If we fold the system along the twist defect so that it just looks like a, a system with a boundary, how does, it, how does your improvement of a factor of two compare to compare? Do you understand what I'm asking? Like yeah. the, the interface, we could just think it's a boundary of a doubled system. Yeah, there, you, are, there are trade offs here, right? Now you just doubled the number of qubits that we need in the bulk. You can certainly do that. You also have to be a little careful because we've just changed the notion of locality, but you could certainly fold this to find a code with twist defects in the boundary. But that will be. And I guess you told me that the locality here is not really related to the locality of the lab and the way these things interact, right? So. That was the answer to the question about what the Hamiltonian is. So maybe I don't have to worry so much about that. Um, I guess my point is if you fold this over and there's some local error, local in, in space in your system, now that will affect both layers. So in the unfolded picture, that'll look like you have some layer, up, uh, some error all the way over here and all the way over here. That's fine. Now you just have to deal with that class of errors. But But the larger point is when I said that you had to double the period if you want to put it in the planar geometry and not store it in the boundary. That assumes that I have a single layer of this code. 
there's some special property of a single layer of this code. You don't have that problem if you have a stack of two copies, and that's what you've done by folding it. There's this index that you can compute at the boundary, and it's non-trivial if you have a single layer. It's trivial if you have two layers. But does your construction map to sort of a doubled version of that boundary picture that you that you said before required six measurements? Like, can we map them directly? Um, I don't see how to map them directly. So in both cases, the bulk is described by the topological of a order of a Torah code. Neither of them is like the double of the other. Intuitively, in that boundary construction, intuitively, you take these twist effects, you move them to the corners of the system, and you recover their picture. But that's loose, and, and we don't know actually how to, to do that in this example. Okay, let me just make some quick further comments here. I've showed you how to store information in a planar geometry. We can also do computations with our twist effects. Just as an example, one of the operations that we can do fault tolerantly is a phase gate. This is like a, should be thought of as similar to a Hadamard, but now it's between X and Y. And that operation is done in four steps. You introduce an additional pair of, maybe if I store a single qubit using four twist effects, now I introduce a pair of ancillary twist defects. I reconnect them by different defect lines, remove some of those twist defects, shift them, and I claim that this implements a logical SK. Again, we're restricted to, it, to doing Clifford gates. In order to obtain a universal gate set, you need this magic state injection or some other trick. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that we have a ZN generalization. We can define flow K codes on n-dimensional qubits, such that each of the instantaneous stabilizer groups are characterized by the same topological order as a, a ZN gauge theory. And lastly, using these ZN flow K codes, we can define flow K codes with instantaneous stabilizer groups characterized by more exotic topological orders, such as that as the double semion. And the way we do that is we create a network of defect lines, and these defect lines are semi-permeable, meaning some anions can pass freely through these defects, others become confined. The deconfined anions are precisely that in this example of a double semion. Okay, last slide coming up here. Let me describe some potential future directions. So flow K codes are fairly natural to implement on IBM's hardware. IBM's qubits are connected in a heavy hexagonal lattice, meaning there's a qubit at each vertex and a qubit at each edge, which I haven't drawn here. The qubits on the edges can be used as ancilla to make your two-body measurements. So their hardware is natural for these types of codes. They also have enough qubits that we can fit some fairly sizable um, twist effects that are fairly well separated. The second thing I'd like to comment on is a potential space-time perspective on twist effects. In a pair of recent works, this described how the toric code and floquet codes can be put on equal footing in a space-time picture. Essentially, they differ by a choice of time axis. The toric code, you take the time axis to be the z direction. The floquet code, you take the time axis to be the 111 direction. And that means that there's a unifying framework for understanding these codes. I think Condensation defects are a unifying framework to understand the manipulations of twist defects and other defects um, in, in this, in this space-time perspective. So then com computations look like some manipulation of condensation defects in time. Last thing I'd like to uh, comment on are some preliminary works in which we've constructed locate codes in three dimensions. These have twist defects similar to the ones that I've described, but they also have the potential for other types of twist defects that allow us to do a broader class of operations beyond Clifford operations. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is like more generally a flow code question. Are the magic state distillation and other protocols equivalent between surface codes and flow code? 
right? Is the protocol for doing magic state injection the same for the flow K code as for the Tor code? Um, I don't know that anyone's written out explicitly how to do magic state injection, but I imagine that they're very similar given the relation between the instantaneous stabilizer groups. So there's probably a straightforward way to adapt current protocols for magic state injection to flow cake. But those are details that need to be worked out there because all the subtleties in this business. Does the ground state depend on the flow cycle period? Sorry, can you say that Does again? The, uh... Ground state depend on your flow cycle period. Does the ground state depend on the flow case cycle? So it depends on what you mean. We we don't really have a, a Hamiltonian here. There's no ground state. If you want to take that in the code state. Ah, does the code state depend on the measurement schedule? Yeah, yeah, it does. So the code state is determined by the stabilizer group. If you change the measurement schedule, you start measuring different operators, you'll have different stabilizer groups, and, and that's different codes, code states. Uh, so what if it's they're the, the same stabilizers, but you measure them on a different schedule? So if you have the same set of stabilizers um, and, and you measure these, then in, in principle, they'll be commuting because you have the same set of stabilizers. So you'll have the same set of code states. So in that case, the code states don't change. That's kind of like the toric code. Uh, you can measure the vertex stabilizer and the plaquette stabilizers in any order you want because they stabilize the same states. Yeah. Okay. In the middle picture, yeah. if the, each layer is an instantaneous stabilizer group, then isn't time running along the z-axis? So why did you say it's running along the one one one? Oh, um, yeah. This is just a schematic picture. This isn't necessarily for a flow k code. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm happy to elaborate on that on that statement. Well, I guess you didn't label this axis. Yeah. I just label x y and z. Sure. Yeah. That's the technical. That's the that's the technical as well. It's just you can you can choose a different time axis layer uh, your ISGs and some sort of foliation and then say okay now you have a condensation. Detail. So are there other codes that happen at other angles in some sense or? Yeah, this is these are very recent papers. There are different ways of moving throughout this space. Um, so far, the examples I know of are toric code and flow K codes, but there are other schemes for doing quantum computation that can be understood in the same space-time uh, formalism, namely measurement-based quantum computation, where you kind of already prepare this, the full space-time state and then make measurements, and this um, scheme by PsyQuantum for doing computation, confusion-based quantum computation. But yeah, that's an interesting question. Change the time direction, what do you get? A more pedestrian question about how this fermion operator gets split into multiple pieces and so where the ends of the defect lines correspond to. So, uh, for example, here this is just one defect line. So, this is three defects. Yeah, yeah. So, so those three, I just mean the so take any one of those. Yeah. Like earlier, you would have, for example, three yellow lines that correspond to just one single long defect line. Yeah, so here, so, I, these are supposed to be gray dash, maybe it's, it's difficult to see. These okay. are the checks that we removed. The twist defects live at the endpoints of those removed check operators. Okay. Yeah, and you know, where, where is the twist defect? You can see that by the fact that I can create some fermion string operator that extends from this point, creates a single fermion. This can absorb EM anions. They can absorb it at that particular point. Yes. So for the Fouquet code, is there any sense they will be more susceptible to like noise that are correlated in time or like partially think about like their sensitivity to like environmental perturbations if one starts to worry about like some microscopic. Detection? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it all ultimately depends on your noise model. It depends on what you assume are the relevant sources of noise, how that noise will affect your system. There have been some preliminary, there, there have been two works that studied the Floquet code in comparison to the Toric code. And it ultimately, again, depends on your sources of noise. Um, for superconducting qubits, the expectation is that the Toric code will perform better 
uh, via some metric. But for topological qubits, like Microsoft's objective to build a quantum computer out of topological qubits, tiny Majorana wires, their two-body measurements are native. So you can assume maybe there's some error in measuring those two-body operators. And in that case, flow K codes outperform the Torah code. But, but we still need to do a, a real careful analysis to compare these codes with twist defects to the Torah code. And I think it's, it, it is kind of impressive that there's at least a regime where the flow K code outperforms the Torah code, especially since the Torah code has been optimized to, to there and back again. I was wondering whether the fact that you you get, you mentioned that like you need more time to do measurements. I thought like those measurements were simultaneous and the four body measurements were simultaneous. Yeah, so the time comes from the fact that you need to couple the qubits to an ancillary qubit. At the end of the day, all you do is measure that ancillary qubit, but it takes time to do that C naught gate that couples them. So it takes four time steps. Oh, I see. C naught time, and then you make your measurement. Yeah, sorry, random question. So you emphasize your system, it's a code, it's not a Hamiltonian, but is there a flow K system with a time dependent Hamiltonian that is somehow analogous or related to your, to, to these flow K codes? Um, uh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe what I can say is, Given these three instantaneous stabilizer groups, or instantaneous code spaces, you can imagine a path of Hamiltonians that hits each of these instantaneous code spaces. So it's like some driven system where your Hamiltonian goes through this, and at some particular instance of time, you'll end up with one of these, um, these instantaneous stabilizer groups. In that case, the answer is yes. People have written down explicit paths of Hamiltonians that hit <laughs> each of these points. And that path in the case that this particular Z2 flow K code has a special point that it goes around a non-trivial uh, loop in the space of Hamiltonians. It actually implements that EM uh, transformation. But that's not a necessity when you put it on a, in a planar geometry. You, you also define a loop of Hamiltonians. Now it's, there, there are six points that you have to go through and that doesn't encircle, that's a trivial, homologically trivial path in specific gapped Hamiltonians. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll thank the speaker on that. Sorry again for the, the slow start. Uh,